Hi, my name is David Hardy, and I am a senior research programmer here with our NIH Center, and um, I'm the lead developer of NAMD, and I'll be telling you about uh, some of the, the features of NAMD and uh, the development that we've been doing uh, to get uh, much better performance on GPUs, and uh, then just some of NAMD's capabilities. Ah, here we go. So, AMD is a parallel molecular dynamics application that's written in C++ with Charm++ objects. And it runs on all major operating systems on laptops up through supercomputers. Uh, we also can run AMD in the cloud. And we specialize in the parallel scaling of large biomolecular simulations. Uh, and, and so really it's that idea of NAMD being a parallel uh, application designed from the outset that has really, uh, you know, helped guide the, the feature set that NAMD supports. So we have uh, uh, beyond basic molecular dynamics, uh, many advanced features as well. So you've already heard about uh, many of the enhanced sampling methods, the alchemical free energy methods. Um, we also have this collective variables module called Polvars. And we, one thing that's unique to NAMD compared with other MD applications is that uh, it's highly customizable with uh, TCL and Python scripting um, available to people that are using NAMD. And, and in fact, the config file itself is actually a TCL script that uh, gets processed by NAMD. So uh, we have uh, uh, over 25,000 registered users, but really uh, a better indication of our impact on the uh, biomedical research community is, is the number of citations that we have for our NAMD reference papers, so over 15,000 citations. So the movie is showing some of our uh, recent uh, investigations of the coronavirus that have been done by uh, scientists here at the center. Uh, so you're seeing um, uh, what is basically part of the coronavirus membrane uh, with, with the spike dynamics. So when we're doing a molecular dynamics simulation, most fundamentally we are solving Newton's equations of motion. So we have this uh, system of uh, ordinary differential equations. Uh, it ends up being uh, a system of uh, three N equations. Uh, where n is the number of particles in your system. And so the basis of what we do in MD simulation is we're integrating the, the system of equations for up to billions of time steps. And um, most of the computational effort goes into calculating the forces between the atoms. So the forces are the negative gradient of this potential energy function that describes the covalent bonding between atoms. And the heaviest part of the computation are the non-bonded interactions. So these are uh, the Leonard-Jones interactions and the electrostatic interactions. And like I said, uh, this, this system of equations forms the basis of what we're, we're solving when we uh, do MD. Uh, but we might uh, have additional terms or uh, additional equations uh, whenever we're doing something beyond just uh, uh, constant energy simulation. So, so uh, we, we would need these for, say, controlling the temperature and the pressure or satisfying constraints or uh, many other things. So... The parallelism for MD is limited to each time step. And um, that's, that's the uh, biggest issue with, with parallelizing MD. 
are the, the biggest challenge because uh, we have to uh, uh, compute these, these time steps sequentially. But we have a lot of work in terms of the forces. So if I can just take you through uh, the computational workflow, we initialize the particle positions and we use these positions to calculate forces and we use the forces to update the positions and we sit in a loop that we might loop over for millions or even billions of time steps, occasionally outputting some sort of reduced quantity like uh, the energy or the temperature or the pressure um, or also a, a snapshot of the position stored as the trajectory of your simulation stored in a trajectory file. And the force calculation itself is most of the computational work. That's, uh, you know, maybe as much as 99% of the computational work. And the, the position update is, is much less. It's only about 1% of the computational work. Now, the parallelism can be improved by decomposing not just the data, but also the work. And so this was uh, uh, something that was, was innovative in NAMD from back in the late 90s. Um, it's, it's very common for a parallel uh, application like this to decompose uh, the data. And so we do that. We, we decompose the atoms into these fixed volume patches. Uh, now, there, we have to calculate that at every time step forces, uh, not just within each patch, but between neighboring patches. And so it is this work of calculating the forces that becomes what we call a compute object. And that's also something that we can, uh, we, we can distribute as like a part of the calculation that's done in parallel. And uh, by including that, that gives us uh, a lot more work that we can then uh, use to uh, scale to much larger uh, processor counts um, to uh, load balance for uh, improved performance, improved uh, parallel scaling. So if you just think in terms of, you know, this uh, diagram in the bottom right, where you have this uh, center patch in the light blue. And so that has a, a purple diamond associated with that. That's the work that you have to do to calculate forces just within that patch. But then you've got all of these other diamonds surrounding it that are the um, uh, computational work that is needed to calculate these interactions between the neighboring patches. And so uh, what we've done then is that, you know, if you consider this now in uh, 3D, and uh, take uh, Newton's third law into account, that gives you 14 purple diamonds for every uh, patch of atoms that you have. And so, so this gives us a lot more work that we can use um, to uh, improve our parallel scaling. Uh, I guess one of the things I, I should mention is that as we're doing this calculation, the atoms are moving around due to the forces. So as we update the positions, the atoms move around and uh, atoms will uh, go from one patch to another patch. And so we have to take this into account. Uh, we call this uh, the atom migration. And so uh, this is typically done, at least for our CPU-based AMD. This is, uh, we have to update the domain decomposition of the atoms then uh, after every 20 steps. And so if I can uh, now show you uh, sort of the, the data flow here between uh, uh, within a time step and the force calculation that's, that's being done, what you have at, at the top of this diagram is you have the patches all lined up uh, that would be distributed across your processors. And then there's this multicast communication operation. And so this is sending the atom positions out to these compute objects. So you have uh, bonded compute objects uh, and then a lot of non-bonded compute objects. And so you can calculate all these things in parallel and then you have to do a reduction, a sum reduction of these uh, different parts of the force uh, that have to be reduced then back to the patches after the, the force calculation is done. Uh, 
And uh, another communication uh, activity that's done that's uh, a little bit different in nature is the electrostatic solver with uh, particle mesh AWALD. And so this actually re requires a point-to-point -point communication scheme uh, because what needs to be done then in memory is uh, or, or across the processors is uh, this uh, 3D FFT to take us to reciprocal space and then do uh, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a summation, a, a very fast summation then across a reciprocal space. And then you have a reverse 3D FFT transformation to take that result back to real space. And so that can all be done again in parallel with all of these uh, uh, these uh, bonded and non-bonded compute objects. And so it's the non-bonded computes that really uh, represent the majority of the work. And so when we were uh, adopting GPU acceleration into NAMBI, that was really the first thing that we were doing was offloading that calculation to the GPU. And then, and so this was back in 2007, right after CUDA came out. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, GPUs were, were uh, a nice accelerator, but um, still th there was, you know, they were quite a bit slower compared to today's standards. And so um, as, uh, as uh, these um, uh, GPUs became uh, more capable over the years, we were able to offload more and more of the force calculation. So that included then the bonded computes and also the parts of the PME algorithm that uh, could uh, could uh, be be distributed in parallel. So the the FFTs are, are very challenging to to um, to uh, calculate and communicate, and uh, that you know due to the limited amount of computation that you are actually doing when you do an FFT. And um, the latency required to uh, then communicate that stuff to the GPU so that you can do some processing on the GPU and get a result back. It's, it's really um, not feasible to do that calculation then on the GPU when you're doing a large uh, distributed parallel job. Uh, but, you know, the charge spreading and the force interpolation parts, these are highly localized parts. And so these map quite well to the GPU. And in fact, for really large parallel jobs, we have um, a, a special thing that we do here where um, instead of doing just the standard fourth order interpolation for uh, PME, we crank it up to an eighth order interpolation, which really puts a lot more work into the charge spreading and the force interpolation, but then to maintain the same order of accuracy, we can increase the grid spacing. So we have um, uh, a lot fewer grid points. In fact, uh, one eighth the total number of grid points now for uh, the FFT. So it effectively uh, decreases the bandwidth of the communication that we have to do to support these uh, 3D FFTs by a factor of one eighth. So, so that's a trick that we can do to support really large uh, simulations. And so all of this uh, allows NAMD to scale really well on CPUs and GPUs. So here I'm showing you some examples of uh, our scaling on uh, Frontera, which is um, uh, one of the largest uh, computers that's uh, available through, I, I don't think that's available through Exceed, but, but anyway, it's, uh, it's um, the, the largest uh, NSF uh, resource uh, that's available right now. And um, so that's a CPU-based machine. Um, now, uh, Summit, on the other hand, is the fastest uh, uh, pub publicly available supercomputer in the, the United States uh, uh, through, you know, various uh, DOE funding. And um, so um, uh, Summit is GPU accelerated. So, so we can basically take advantage of both types of platforms and, and parallel scaling on both of these platforms. Uh, here I'm showing also that um, we're, we're uh, measuring the, the performance here on these benchmark systems. 
And uh, this is also kind of interesting. We put these benchmark systems together using uh, this satellite tobacco mosaic virus, which is just over a million atoms. And uh, it's a nice, perfect cube uh, for, for the system. And so you can build up bigger systems by replicating uh, this and uh, laying it out into kind of a, a matrix. And so um, the, the smaller system uh, that has uh, the, the higher, uh, you're getting the higher performance numbers on the 21 million atom system. And so that's a five by two by two grid of STMV. Uh, the bigger system, which is 224 million atoms here is a seven by six by five grid. And so this is just a really nice way of putting together synthetic benchmarks that can then capture the scaling of NAMD to, you know, whatever size system that you might be interested in, in benchmarking. And of course, NAMD is used uh, much more than just benchmarking. Um, so uh, we uh, worked with uh, the Amaro lab at uh, UCSD last year um, in a collaboration that ended up winning the Gordon Bell Special Prize at SC20. And so this was simulations of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And there was uh, really a large amount of NAMD simulation work in this project, over a zetaflop of simulation, in fact. Um, and much of this was done just towards characterizing the um, uh, spike, uh, the, the, the spike protein complex of, of the uh, of SARS CoV 2. And, um, and, and so much of that was actually run on Frontera. Um, but then uh, the, the group also uh, assembled the viral membrane and had all of the uh, uh, spikes embedded in the, the viral membrane and uh, put together a 305 million atom simulation that, that included all of this detail. And this is what we uh, did sort of our uh, uh, large parallel scaling run on uh, using Summit. And for this, we were able to scale this uh, across almost all of Summit. So 4,096 nodes this is really about the, the largest job that ever gets run on Summit. And uh, so, um, and, and we were very pleased that, uh, that NAMD was able to uh, get uh, over 50% uh, strong scaling efficiency on, on the system. Uh, we have since been collaborating with them again, and unfortunately I don't have a slide put together on this, but um, the, the new cl collaboration involves uh, simulating uh, aerosol. Uh, so uh, basically coronavirus in like these uh, tiny droplets that are then in vacuum. And this entire simulation uh, was around a billion atoms. And again, we were able to uh, scale this uh, up to 4,096 nodes of, of summit again uh, for, for this year's uh, Gordon Bell submission. And so let me then change gears and tell you about the available versions of NAMD. Uh, we have NAMD 214 which is our most recent feature complete release. Uh, this was uh, back, released back in, I think, uh, August of 2020. And um, so this is what I demonstrated in those previous scaling plots. And this was used for that uh, 2020 Gordon Bell scaling on Summit. Uh, what we also have is a nightly build. And so as NAMD is being developed, you can get uh, a snapshot Every single night, you know, the AMD's rebuilt, and this is really just supported as a Linux-only release. Um, but you know, this this gives you a way to uh, uh, maybe track new feature developments and what's going in towards the upcoming 215 release. Now, something we did last year that we hadn't really done in the past was we had some. Uh, alpha releases where we actually uh, did, did some, some early pre-releases um, and, and really due to the pandemic, we wanted to make 
the fastest versions of our software available. And we uh, have been doing a lot of development, especially with uh, NAMD running on GPUs. And so we have uh, several different uh, alpha versions uh, that we released. We uh, released a version that uh, supports Intel AVX 512 optimizations. And uh, so, so that's a, a perfect fit for running on Frontera. Uh, we also have an alpha 215 alpha version with the GPU offload support for AMD GPUs. So uh, that's, that's new, nice and new and exciting. Uh, but uh, the, the, the big uh, performance boost comes from what we're calling the MD3 alpha. And so this is the version with a GPU resident support for now, right now, just for NVIDIA GPUs, but soon we're going to have uh, this as well available for AMD GPUs. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what GPU resident means and how that uh, is different from GPU offload. Uh, real quick question. Uh -huh. Does the 3.0 also include the uh, features from the uh, 2.15, I think it was? The Specifically, I'm asking about the AMD GPU offload support. Um, I... That's a good question. Right now, the two are in different branches in our repository. And so there's a lot uh, of, you know, what is now 215 in the, you know, the 3.0 branch, or what we call these as master and DL branches. Uh, but not everything right now. Right now, uh, the 3.0 uh, branch is not a, a superset of the master branch. And so I'm but the plan, not sure. the plan is that it will be. U ultimately, when AMD3 becomes a released thing and rather than a, a developmental version, it'll include a superset of all those features. Exactly. Yes. Awesome. Thanks. OK, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the features that were new in 2.14. Uh, so uh, one of the major ones was uh, this hybrid single dual topology for FEP. And uh, the idea is it gives you the ease of uh, setting up the problem uh, in terms of, you can think in terms of a dual topology. Uh, but then it gives you the faster convergence to solution that you get from a single topology. And so uh, the idea is, is shown in the, the top diagram to the right, where what you do is you find a maximum uh, common substructure between what would be your you know, two endpoints of your FEP simulation. And then you use holonomic constraints to really keep that substructure together throughout uh, the, the simulation. And so, so really this, this gives you what is effectively a single topology treatment then. Uh, there were also updates to coal bars. Uh, there was uh, alchemical free energy support for this WCA, uh, Weeks Chandler Anderson decomposition of Leonard Jones. Uh, there were also, um, uh, improvements to the hybrid QMMM simulation uh, to support multiple QM regions. And um, I think now NAMD might be one of the few codes that can actually uh, support multiple QM regions properly, where if the QM regions are, are close together, they are going to you know, see each other in other ways than just the electrostatics. Um, there were many other additional improvements. Um, I guess um, one of the important ones I should point out was uh, PSF Gen had some major updates that provided support for doing hydrogen or formulating hydrogen mass repartitioned systems uh, and also support for putting together uh, uh, systems that have lone pairs and, Drew, uh, and is, are using the Drude force field. And so 
with NeoB 2.15, um, these, these features are still in development right now, um, but we will be gradually releasing them. The, the highest priority for us is uh, supporting LJPME. So this is uh, to approximate the long range dispersion interactions. And uh, this is important because it is supported by the new charm force field. And so we want NAMD to be able to support the, the force field as you know uh, expected by the, the biomedical community. And um, here we are maintaining the Lawrence birth lot combining rules, um, but we're using a geometric combining for the reciprocal space. So that means that we can do this with just uh, one set of 3D FFT transformations instead of seven that you would have to do if you actually wanted to um, re reflect these um, the, the Lawrence birth lot combining rules across reciprocal space too. But really, there doesn't seem to be a need to in terms of the accuracy of this. And so, so um, and so the, this this it would be a huge impact on performance if you were to actually you know uh, do that. Um, another big one is uh, alchemical free energy methods, uh, FEP and TI, both with GPU acceleration. And this is actually something that's already supported in NAMD3, but we'll be bringing this in to NAMD215. Uh, we will have improved support for uh, Amber Parm 7 files that include uh, CMAP. Uh, we'll have a higher quality random number generator. I don't know if that matters to a lot of you, but you know it will allow NAMD to produce much better statistical results. Um, and I guess the big thing here is much better hardware support. So um, we'll we'll have support now for uh, these AVX five twelve optimizations, AMD GPUs, and Intel GPUs. So in our NAMD 3.0 feature development, and so this is really stuff uh, pertaining to this GPU resident stuff that I still need to tell you some more details about. Um, the, the idea with the GPU resident code is that we've moved uh, essentially all the calculation to the GPU. So the integration, rigid bond constraints, uh, that stuff is, is now all uh, performed on the GPU when you run in this, uh, on this GPU resident code path. And uh, so right now with this, we have the essential standard integration methods supported. So that would be constant energy, uh, constant temperature with either Langevin damping or stochastic rescaling, constant pressure with Langevin piston, uh, multiple time stepping and rigid bond constraints. So all of that stuff right now is supported. We do have some advanced features already supported. So like I said before, the alchemical free energy methods for FEP and TI. Um, the uh, multi-copy simulation is supported. So you can actually run replica exchange methods uh, with this. Um, and we uh, support uh, applying an external electric field. And some features that are under development but soon to be released are uh, steered molecular dynamics and grid forces. And uh, we've developed a Monte Carlo barostat. And the reason why that's important is that um, the standard Langevin piston uh, barostat that we use uh, really uh, causes a, a bit of a performance hit because it needs to recalculate the, um, the uh, virial tensor at every step. And so by removing that calculation and uh, using an alternative barostat, in this case, you uh, can, can uh, calculate the, the Monte Carlo barostat uh, completely based on, on an energy calculation and a possible reevaluation of the energy whenever you're updating the, the barostat. But you know, since you only need to uh, update this barostat 
every 100 steps, make, make one of these Monte Carlo moves every 100 steps. Uh, this turns out to run at almost the uh, same performance as you get with uh, Langevin damping. And so um, it uh, really helps performance of the GPU resonant code. Um, so there are other features that are extremely challenging and are that will require extensive porting to the GPU. Uh, the, the biggest one for us will be the Colvars module. Um, right now, Colvars uh, wants to do CPU calculation on every single time step, which uh, for uh, running on the GPU, that means that you have to transfer data from the GPU to the CPU and do some calculation and transfer uh, the result back. And that's effectively like tying a big boat anchor around your fast GPU code. Um, so it's the, the way Colvars is implemented at the moment just is uh, incompatible with uh, running a GPU resonant code. And uh, so there are things we could do where we can uh, maybe accelerate certain collective variables um, are, uh, you know, maybe even work with the Colvars team. That's another problem too, is that this is not code that we develop here at our NIH center. This is externally developed code, but maybe they'll be open to uh, working with us to uh, provide uh, hooks into their code to manipulate quantities that are on the GPU. So we'll have to see how we can uh, bridge this divide right now. So I'll tell you briefly about the AVX 512 kernels. Um, this is interesting because what this was, was a porting of our CUDA tiles kernels algorithm for the short range non-bonded forces into uh, these, uh, into uh, this AVX 512 accelerated uh, CPU code. And um, it uh, almost doubles the performance, which, which is uh, really uh, uh, very nice. Um, it's uh, since there, there are other challenges with, you know, uh, vectorizing other aspects of AMD that, you know, possibly we could get even bigger benefits from this eventually if we're able to address other issues that, you know, would be slowing this particular optimization down. Um, but uh, as it stands, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, quite nice, and it works with uh, any uh, Intel uh, CPU that supports uh, these AVX512 um, instructions, which uh, now you even have support for this in laptops. And so, you know, this could uh, potentially benefit a, a lot of people. So now I want to tell you a little bit about um, our GPU developments. And so we had uh, already been doing a, a lot of work towards uh, more effective use of GPUs. So, so this development really dates back over the last three years. Um, but NAMD uh, originally had a GPU offload scheme. And so there was sort of this partitioning of work between the CPU and GPU that eventually evolved into all of the force calculation being done on GPUs. And we would still keep the, the integrator and the rigid bond constraints all done on the CPU. And so here we were treating the GPU uh, like this, you know, offload accelerator device where we were sending it the new positions at each force evaluation and then getting back forces from it. And this GPU offload scheme was really good enough until uh, the Pascal generation of GPUs came out uh, in about 2016. So here I'm showing you a, uh, a profiling that's showing a, a timeline of the performance when running on a Maxwell uh, GPU. So the generation of GPU prior to Pascal. And we see that the, the timeline with the GPU utilization is really full. I mean, there, there are really not that many discernible gaps in the timeline. So we're using the GPUs quite effectively here, 
uh, it's because we're doing, the, uh, in part, it's because we're doing the streaming of forces. So as, as forces are calculated, they're being streamed back to the CPU. And as each CPU patch finally gets the forces it needs, it can go ahead and, and proceed with uh, the next part of its numerical integration. And um, so anyway, this, this approach uh, was working quite well to allow this over overlap of CPU and GPU computation. However, things started to change whenever uh, Pascal and then the Volta generation uh, came out. So uh, we saw this uh, quite, uh, it, was, it was quite pronounced when uh, we saw a 70% performance improvement between Pascal and Volta in terms of its peak performance. But NAMD back in 2018 had less than a 20% performance improvement when moving from Pascal to Volta. So clearly we weren't using the GPUs as effectively as we would want to. And by doing a profiling again, it was really able to show us that we were CPU bound on Volta and beyond. Okay, so you can see in the diagram here, the force calculation in light blue on the GPU versus the uh, CPU calculation for the integration and related uh, rigid bond constraints, all that uh, related stuff. And, and we can see that uh, the, the, you know, instead of having a solid blue strip across there, meaning that we're always keeping the GPU busy, the GPU is waiting on the CPU to get done with its stuff before it can go and calculate the next batch of forces. And so we needed to fix this. Um, the idea then became apparent to us that offloading the force calculation just was not sufficient. And um, really we weren't use, utilizing the GPUs effectively. And um, it was uh, especially important to us because the majority of MD users that are using NAMD are running system sizes that are less than a million atoms. And today these are suitable for running on a single GPU. And so this meant that we needed to transition the code from being a GPU offload code to GPU resident. So let me show you a schematic of what really this means. When you have a GPU offload code, you've got the CPU here. And so you can think of this in terms of a timeline. Uh, so we're integrating the positions. And then after everybody gets their position integrated, we've got to aggregate all this position data together and copy it to the GPU. And then the GPU can go ahead and calculate all these forces and then stream the forces back uh, so that we can do this next integration step. And so we were in a regime now, like I showed on this timeline schematic, where you know we're waiting for the CPU to go ahead and finish its next integration and aggregation step before we can calculate the next batch of forces. And so in a GPU resonance scheme, uh, what we have is we have um, the data is maintained on the GPU. And so we do this integration on the GPU and then directly on the GPU, we're filling the position buffers, we're calculating the forces, we're fetching those force buffers so that we can go ahead and do the next integration. But by maintaining all of this on the GPU, we're keeping this very fast device occupied and busy doing useful work, you know, much more effectively throughout the simulation. And we can see that by profiling, okay? So, so here's sort of a, a night and day profiling comparison where we see the, the GPU offload, the before on the top, and then the after, the GPU resident, where you see very light CPU activity above and the force, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the GPU activity is thick with you know, force calculation and integration and, and that GPU really is, is staying busy now and being, uh, very effectively utilized now by this new code. And uh, we also see it on our benchmarks as well. So when we look at uh, uh, comparing the GPU, uh, the performance of the GPU offload and uh, the GPU resident versions um, and, and look across at these different system sizes, we are getting uh, at least a 2x speed up all the way across. And, and so uh, we're 
you know, very pleased about uh, these results here. And um, it becomes even more apparent when you look at taking advantage of a GPU dense architecture. So uh, this is a pretty extreme example. This is uh, uh, aggregate throughput uh, measured on a DGX2, which has 16 NVIDIA V100s in it. And so here we're running 16 replicas. And so I'm reporting the total nanoseconds per day, the aggregate of all of all 16 of these simulations, uh, comparing the GPU resident version with the GPU offload version. And uh, so really performance wise, we're smoking the GPU offload version here. Um, it's, it's not even close. Uh, another very interesting thing is that um, with the GPU offload version, the way it's done here, you're getting almost no performance improvement as you change the cutoff distance. And this is pretty interesting. Um, this, this is really a result of, you know, now the GPU kernels themselves will be getting faster because they're doing less work. But what happens is that you've subdivided uh, your, your uh, system into many more patches. And since you're CPU bound based on that patch work, your, the, the work that you're doing on, on the, the integrating those patches, you're really getting no improvement in performance at all on the GPU offload uh, code. And so this is, you know, something, you know, nice to, to take note of here. And our ultimate goal for this was to support GPU dense architectures by scaling a single simulation across multiple GPUs. And so we want to then extend our GPU resident implementation so that we can run a single simulation across uh, tightly coupled GPUs in a single node. And this is also important for, uh, you know, supporting leadership class supercomputers because, uh, you know, not only Summit, but then the, the next supercomputers that are scheduled to come out, I mean, we now have early access to Perlmutter and uh, they are in the process of building Frontier, but all of these will have uh, many GPUs per node. And so the way we approach this was to really go back to um, you know, the, the idea of what NAMD is doing with, with its decomposition, okay, except now we really have an aggregated decomposition that we're supporting. Um, but what we have to do then is that we still have to take into account the fact that we need to communicate uh, information between these GPUs. And so similarly to the, the, the CPU version of the diagram that, that you saw on the, the previous uh, page, we need to uh, be able to uh, do a position multicast between the work that's divided up between these GPUs. And then after we've calculated the forces on each GPU, we need to do a force reduction back. And so you can think of it looking like this, where we need to, you know, uh, communicate our, our positions to a different GPU. And then we're going to have to um, uh, reduce the forces back from that GPU that did the calculation. And so we did this using a point to point uh, scheme for these position multicasts and these force reductions. Um, another thing that we did was we introduced a spin lock barrier to uh, overcome uh, these uh, synchronization issues that we were having with the CPU threading part of the code. And uh, it's giving us um, some uh, really nice uh, speed ups. Uh, they're not, they're not ideal speed ups. They're not, we're not you know, getting, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a true linear speed up yet. Um, but, you know, as 
in terms of a first effort here, this is quite nice to be able to support um, a, a simulating a system of say the size of STMV then across uh, all of the GPUs in a, say a DGX A100. And uh, so in this uh, particular uh, uh, performance uh, reporting here, uh, this is showing the difference between the red and the blue line of introducing a shorter cutoff. So say instead of uh, doing a charm-based force field, you're using an amber-based force field and, and feel comfortable using an eight angstrom cutoff for that. Well, that can you know, give you uh, maybe a, a two-thirds performance boost. And then you can get another you know, sizable performance boost, you know, not doubling, but maybe yet another two-thirds performance boost if you introduce then something like hydrogen mass repartitioning. So that you know, instead of doing multiple time stepping, you're just doing uh, single time steps of you know, four femtoseconds. So there are issues with scaling, obviously, on that last plot. And so let's talk about what they are. Uh, the main one is from PME. Um, so PME is not only a scaling bottleneck for, for CPU-based NAMD, but now even running uh, the scaling NAMD across multiple GPUs. Um, but the reason is due to the nature of the PME algorithm, you really can't uh, uh, decompose the, the 3D FFT operations well across multiple GPUs. Uh, the, the latency involved with doing that is just too high. So we really right now in the code are assigning PME to a single device without really taking into account all of the other work that that GPU already had assigned to it. So, so again, this is really causing the, the majority of the scaling bottleneck that you're seeing on the previous slide, okay? It's because all of these devices here are waiting for the PME evaluation in each step. And so some ways we could mitigate this is to um, assign the PME evaluation to one GPU and assign it nothing else. Um, so this at least is uh, a better way to balance the load because now you don't have everybody waiting on a single person. You have one single GPU that might get done a lot faster, um, but then everybody else is, you know, working together. Um, there are better ways that we can deal with this though. Um, like I said before, uh, PME has different phases to it. And uh, uh, some of the big phases to it include the charge spreading phase and the force interpolation phase. These could actually be decomposed across the different GPUs. And then you could have one GPU that's just dealing with the 3D FFT portion. Um, and then we could make sure that it has some work to do uh, along with whatever remaining work it does. Um, Anyway, we have to be a little bit careful, but you know there could be ways to effectively load balance this across across the eight GPUs. Or in this case, I think we're even uh, maybe showing this across uh, the DGX two, so that would be across sixteen GPUs. However, ultimately, we would like to replace a poorly scaling algorithm with a better scaling algorithm, and uh, we have one in hand. Uh, it's called the multi-level summation method. And it provides better scaling uh, because it's based on this hierarchical grid calculation where you're calculating parts of uh, this, this um, long range electrostatic uh, calculation, but now done all in real space and done on uh, grids of um, uh, what decreased size, or you could think of it as, as increased coarseness up to a smallest grid. And uh, so uh, this involves these localized 3D convolutions 
uh, that involve nearest neighbor communication. And, and these calculations turn out, turn out to be really well suited to uh, GPU computation. And on the courses level grid, we still need to do a 3D FFT to account for um, the calculation in reciprocal space, but now we can make this as small as we want. Now, another future improvement to uh, the GPU resident calculation um, involves the atom migration step that I told you about earlier. So this is the one part of, of this GPU resident code path that still needs to involve the CPU processing. It's at this point where um, we need to copy all the atom data back to the CPU and then the CPU itself is doing this, um, uh, basically updating the, uh, uh, the, the, the parallel decomposition of the atoms. And then, uh, then, then uh, copying uh, data back to the GPUs. And so th this ends up being a, a pretty heavyweight operation. And profiling here uh, shows that um, at least for this particular system, uh, which this might have been uh, profiled on APOA1, um, but the time for atom migration here is equal to about 48 MD steps. And so the way we're getting around this right now, the way we're mitigating the effect of this in the GPU resonant version of the code is that we actually increase the patch size and that allows us to run time steps for a much longer duration until you finally need to uh, migrate. And we can even detect when we need to migrate. And so that's what we're doing right now in the GPU code, uh, the GPU resident code, is that you know, we're running with this increased patch size. Uh, we're, we're doing uh, and we're delaying atom migrations as much as possible. Um, so the, the work on, on moving the atom migration to the GPU turns out to be pretty extensive because we need to introduce a lot of extra data to the GPU. Um, the so, sort of the, the fundamentals of the atom topology needs to be uh, introduced onto the GPU. And so we are working on uh, moving this, you know, atom migration step to the GPU code. Um, but, you know, it's, it's taking some effort and it's, it's taking some uh, design effort really to um, figure out how to do this right. Once we do have this, we can actually start running the GPU resident code with a smaller, tighter patch size that will actually uh, improve performance for the, the short range non-bonded kernels. So uh, conceivably, once we get atom migration to the GPU, not only do we not have this final remaining CPU bottleneck anymore, but it could actually make uh, the average time step run a lot faster too. And finally, what we want to do with the GPU resonant version, now that we can scale uh, across uh, tightly coupled GPUs in a node, is that we would like to uh, also scale across multiple nodes. And so we're looking at this in different ways, OK? One, one of the first things we thought of was, well, we're running a really well across a DGX. You know, what if we were to run across uh, two DGX boxes that are uh, attached? You know, with you know high-speed InfiniBand, and and so in that case, we have actually talked about exploiting uh, these uh, InfiniBand connected uh, nodes using the RDMA hardware acceleration that they have. And so uh, we would use these fabric-based switches or, you know, uh, net NICs to do uh, collective operations and reductions to uh, avoid 
post-CPU involvement. And I think that would work with um, doing, doing a, a limited multi-node scaling. Um, ultimately, if we want to run something like this to scale across a really large um, uh, GPU-based uh, supercomputer, we're going to need to involve uh, our Charm++ framework. Um, and so use GPU direct communication. And we'll also you know, need the load balancing then to understand GPU workloads. And so those are two of the things that uh, we're, we're missing right now or, or that we're not using from Charm++. Um, and, and so that's, that's something else that we're looking into further down the road. So another challenge that we have in front of us is support for new GPUs. And two of the, the first two uh, exascale capable machines that are being built here in the US uh, do not have NVIDIA GPUs. And so uh, you have one at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory that's gonna have AMD GPUs, and you have another one at uh, Argonne National Laboratory that's gonna have Intel GPUs. So for supporting AMD GPUs, um, we're able to use HIPify to translate CUDA to HIP, you know, and, and, and HIP is, is AMD's language uh, comparable to CUDA. And in fact, it's, it's so comparable that it allows for an almost direct translation of, you know, API call to API call effectively. And there are a few additional tweaks, but we have uh, most of those worked out right now. Okay, so uh, the, the hip wavefront, or you could think of the SIMD vector width of uh, the AMD GPUs is twice what you have in CUDA. And so we've had to do some adjustments in the code to account for this different SIMD vector size. Um, we also, need some macro definitions in an extra header file, and we have to do some work around for certain features that we were using on the N NVIDIA GPUs, like we were able to use a uh, fast texture memory uh, lookup and interpolation from texture memory. Um, but we've worked out most of those kinks. Uh, the GPU offload version is already available. Um, our uh, former colleague here, Julio Maya, is now working for AMD, and he is uh, developing the GPU resonant version now, uh, support for, for AMD GPUs. And uh, so we are, uh, we'll hopefully be able to release that very soon. Um, now, the Intel GPU support is more involved. We've been uh, collaborating with uh, Tarek Mollis from Intel, and uh, Jamin Choi is uh, uh, from uh, one of our uh, NI Center uh, graduate students who is um, also working in this effort. And uh, for, this, for th this GPU support, we're actually having to rewrite um, the, the CUDA kernels uh, using Intel's uh, language that they've introduced, DPC++. Well, um, DPC++ is built on uh, this uh, Sickle uh, language, which is, you know, a, a, a standard language that's been introduced and uh, involves standardization among a lot of uh, interested parties in, in this space of, of calculating on, on, uh, on GPU devices and, and uh, really how you express uh, your code parallelization. And so DPC++ is really uh, Intel's extensions to Sickle and they're working closely with the Sickle community. So you can think of this as really um, a standard-based approach, more standard really than CUDA is, which you know, uh, as, as good as CUDA has been, it's not ever going to be adopted as a standard, you know, that, that runs across uh, many different devices. Um, and, but the burden on us, of course, is that this is requiring uh, a complete code rewrite here 
and really it's its own implementation. Uh, so so it's it's really swelling up the the size of our source code by doing this. And um, one fortunate thing is that there is a conversion tool that they can use to um, uh, directly translate kernels. But a lot of the work is uh, due to needing to fix some things about the kernels. Uh, sometimes it has to do with, say, um, uh, use of, of uh, uh, you know, various, various uh, atomic operations and, and things like that. And, um, and, and but, but we really have to fix a lot of uh, the glue that, between these kernels. And so, um, um, was there a question? Oh, I guess not. And so, um, so anyway, th this has been a work that's been going on now for over a year to do uh, a, a DPC++ translation. And we are very close to having uh, a working GPU offload version. And uh, so very soon we'll be getting into uh, porting the GPU resident code path as well, because we want all of this supported also on the, the Intel GPUs. But it's it's taking a, a quite a bit of effort, and so finally, I need to acknowledge our funding. Uh, the DPC plus plus porting is also being funded in part by Intel, and um, then we are working uh, in this GPU code development with a lot of people, both uh, some people at UIUC, but then also a lot of external people as well. So Julio Maya at AMD, David Clark at NVIDIA, Tarek Mollis and Mike Brown at Intel. So thanks, and I'm happy to answer questions now. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I'm new to NAMD and I have a quick question. Uh, when I download the NAMD, there are two versions, uh, the source code and there is something that they call pre-compiled NAMD. Uh, is it okay to use the pre-compiled NAMD for production or it, you just put that for testing and just running the NAMD? Uh, we, we intend the pre-compiled versions to be used for production. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, really, it depends on where you're running the MD as to whether you would feel the need to recompile it or not. It's not undoable. I mean, it's 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 not impossibly hard to compile the MD, but um, it's uh, you know there's enough complication to it that you know if you're new to building software for you know. A Linux or whatever platform you happen to be on, it might be, uh, you know, the the best case for you would probably be uh, trying to use a, a pre-compiled binary. Um, yeah, um, my intention is to use the pre-compiled Lambda on AWS in Amazon or maybe Google Colab or some cloud service like that. Is it okay to use that service uh, to use Lambda on those services? Uh, yes. And in fact, um, we uh, uh, do have, um, I think we do have some pre-built containers available for AWS, although I don't know that they've been, how, how recently they've been updated. So um, John, would you happen to know uh, if John is actually online or not? I don't think John's with us right now. So I think he'll step out. But uh, regarding okay. the cloud cloud computing, um, so we have a talk on Friday. Um, so that that will there we will have all the information for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.